briefly recalling the state machine replication abstraction, um, or the Byzantine consensus abstraction, which is sort of the core underlying primitive behind blockchains. So here, roughly, you have a set of servers or nodes that are seeking um, to agree on a consistent ordering of transactions that are received from clients. And this needs to happen even if some of these nodes are faulty or even actively malicious in that they are arbitrarily deviating from the protocol. So this work will focus on a permission setting where all the nodes kind of know each other and the identities. So typically, the state machine replication abstraction considers two properties, consistency, or sometimes called safety, which ensures that all of the honest nodes agree on the same output ledger, so the same ordering of transactions. And the second property is liveness, which means that client transactions that are submitted to this system are incorporated into this ledger quickly or even eventually. But it turns out that there's no actual restriction in this abstraction on the actual ordering of transactions that's in the ledger. And it turns out that the ordering is actually quite easy to manipulate. So if you look at leader-based protocols, where a single leader can choose the ordering, or even more permissionless protocols like Bitcoin or Ethereum, where a single miner can choose the ordering, um, you can see that the ordering is very easy to manipulate in real protocols. So just to kind of briefly describe why transaction ordering is so important, let's take a look um, at decentralized finance in particular, and um, this, pro this thing called decentralized exchanges, which allow you to swap between assets on a blockchain. So here, typically, the exchange price between two cryptocurrencies is um, computed programmatically. And you can see that when you buy a token from the exchange, the price for the next transaction goes up. And when you sell to the exchange, the price can go down. So now let's take an example of a user, Alice, who wants to buy a token T from the exchange. Now, an adversary that sees this transaction, what it can do is insert two transactions, one before Alice and one after Alice. So the before transaction will buy the same token, and the transaction after Alice will sell the token. So this is what's colloquially known as a sandwich attack. And what this ends up doing is it results in a worse execution price for Alice, and the adversary is able to profit from the difference in prices that it caused by manipulating the transaction ordering. And order manipulation has been known to affect real users. Um, and a lot of this is quite reminiscent of the impact of high frequency trading in its early days of Wall Street, as popularized by Michael Lewis' book, Flash Boys. And actually, similar um, things have been observed even on permissionless blockchains, uh, starting with this work called Flash Boys 2.0 that also came out of our group at Cornell, and later work um, describing more in depth about the amount of value that's being extracted at the expense of users. So in fact, a very conservative estimate, a uh, very conservative lower bound, says that there was about 600 to 700 million dollars of value that was extracted from Ethereum in just a few years. Um, and this doesn't take into account a lot of popular strategies, so this may be well over like a billion dollars in actuality. So with this sort of motivation, a couple years ago, in a work at Crypto 2020 with co-authors Fan, Steven, and Ari, we introduced a third consensus property, which we called transaction order fairness. So this was targeted primarily at the ordering part to make sure that the ordering was decentralized. So it, it quite nicely generalizes like a property called first in, first out ordering um, based on a distributed network rather than a single party. It also has some nice theoretical implications in that it generalizes Byzantine agreement validity to the more continuous state machine replication setting. Um, and even if you're not uh, wanting to get any first in, first out kind of time-based ordering properties, you can just think of it as decentralizing the ordering instead of a single node being charged of it. And in fact, it actually turns out to be stronger in many ways than previous properties like causal ordering, um, which use privacy to make sure that the ordering is determined before revealing the transaction contents. But still, you can combine our techniques with privacy at the network layer for better protection. So what does order fairness mean? What are these properties of uh, fair ordering? So we started with this kind of intuitive first in, first out notion, which we called receive order fairness. So the high level property is as follows. For a fairness parameter gamma, which is between half and one, you can think of receive order fairness as if gamma times n nodes receive 
some transaction M1 before M2, so a large fraction of nodes receive M1 before M2, then all of the honest nodes will deliver M1 before M2. So this is quite a natural definition, but it turns out that it, there's an impossibility to result that we came up with which takes inspiration from Condorcet paradox and social choice theory. So the Condorcet paradox says that the global ordering can be non-transitive even when your individual orderings are transitive. So here's a very simple example with three nodes where the three nodes have received transactions in this order, and you can kind of see that if you look at the transactions X and Y, then two, tra two nodes have received X before Y, two nodes have received Y before Z, and two nodes have received Z before X. And this turns out to be a cyclic ordering, which shows that you can't order these transactions um, fairly. You have to kind of order them together, or in other words, really picking whatever ordering you want between them if you enforce a total ordering, you should be fine with it. So that's basically the point that, of the relaxation that we made. We call this batch order fairness. And the only difference here is instead of outputting M1 before M2, as you did with receive order fairness, you now just guarantee that M1 is output no later than M2. So in particular, it's output in the same batch as M2, and you can take these non-transitive paradoxical orderings and output them in the same batch. And as I said, transactions in the same batch can also be totally ordered at the end for execution, but you just ignore the unfairness resultant of these paradoxical orderings. So in our work, we provided a protocol called Iquitas. Iquitas works in three stages where transactions um, go through each of these three stages before delivering in the final output ledger. Um, and Iquitas is able to guarantee this batch order fairness notion. So the first two stages are um, what we can think about as just the consensus part of the protocol, so I won't go into them in too much detail, but we use uh, just standard consensus and broadcast primitives. The third stage is actually the finalization stage, which is completely local computation, and that enables nodes to build this um, ordering um, that's fair. So how does the Iquitas finalization work? So the algorithm is actually not that complicated. So basically what it does, it builds a graph where uh, the, the vertices in the graph are transactions, and the edges denote ordering preferences. So an edge from A to B would say that a large majority of, trans, uh, large majority of nodes receive transaction A before B. And now you can see that there can be cycles in this graph because of this Condorcet paradox. So every strongly connected component, in fact, in this graph will correspond to a, some non-transitive or paradoxical ordering. And so to order these, we'll compute the condensation graph, which will collapse all these strongly connected components into a single vertex. And now to get the final ordering, you just compute the topological sorting of this graph and output the part that is stabilized, which means that its strongly connected component will no not change anymore. And this kind of ensures consistent ordering among the different nodes. So this protocol Iquitas, we provided a couple different alternatives in a synchronous network. Um, you can get when honest majority for the simplest parameter gamma equals one, and in general, the threshold is n greater than 2f over 2 gamma uh, minus 1. We also had an asynchronous protocol, which required 4f plus 1 in the simplest parameter choice. And what's cool about Iquitas is it had minimally relaxive batch fairness in that it achieved the stronger receive order fairness property when there were no paradoxical Condorcet cycles. But the problem with Iquitas was that it wasn't really practical. So this work, Themis, is basically exactly um, the same properties as Iquitas, the same ordering properties and the same security notions as Iquitas, but it is a significantly more practical design. And what we do here is we make the consensus part more efficient by using a standard technique of going through a leader node. Here, the intuition is that replicas can send their local ordering, so the ordering in which they receive transactions from clients, to the leader, and the leader now creates this um, ordering as a joint proposal between the transaction orderings from all the other nodes and proves correct computation of this ordering. And this can actually be bootstrapped from any partially synchronous leader-based protocol with minimal overhead. 
So this design sounds quite intuitive, but we ran into a bunch of pitfalls when I'm trying to make things more efficient this way. It turns out that these Condorcet cycles, these paradoxical orderings, they can extend for arbitrarily long in, our, in length and, and in time as well. It depends only on the specific input ordering and not always on what the adversarial actions are, but this can still pose a problem. And basically, this, uh, it turns out that these Condorcet cycles, although we did not notice it in the Iquitas paper, results in um, Iquitas achieving a weaker notion of liveness, which basically says that you get liveness only when this cycle ends or finishes. So using a naive strategy of just putting um, the communication through leader actually doesn't work because it turns out because of these arbitrary length Condorcet cycles, you can end up with honest leader proposing completely empty blocks for extended periods of time. So for that, um, in Themis, we introduced two techniques to get around this. We call these batch unspooling and deferred ordering. So the key observation here is that if you look at practical deployments, like smart contracts or any kind of execution layer, you'll require all of the transactions to be totally ordered, so even the ones in the cycle or batch. And as I mentioned, batch order fairness supports enforcing any total ordering within a batch and just ignores the unfairness in this cycle. So what our technique of batch unspooling is able to do is able to output a batch step by step instead of all at once, while still guaranteeing that transactions in a batch are output contiguously, so in sequence. So nothing from a later batch will be output before all of the transactions in the current batch have been output. And kind of incorporating this into the design of the protocol itself will help us get back standard liveness. And um, basically, we have another technique called deferred ordering, which allows the unspooling of these batches across multiple leaders. So one of the leaders can continue the batch from a previous leader. So you don't need the batch to finish in one leader, and you can kind of um, continue it in the next leader. So how we do this is the leader can propose a partial ordering of transactions in a batch, and this will be completed by a subsequent honest leader. And this actually depends only on the network delay of the transactions being received by nodes and does not create any weak liveness problems. So the overall upshot of these techniques, the takeaway here is that uh, we are able to fix the liveness problem in Equitas while still keeping the same strong fairness guarantees when the output is uh, required to be totally ordered. So let me go a little bit into depth about how we construct these orderings in Themis and how a leader can continue the ordering of a previous leader. So in Themis, the leader classifies transactions into three types. The first are solid transactions, and these are the ones that are received in n minus 2f of local orderings. So solid transactions can be completely ordered in the current proposal. The second category of transactions is blank transactions. And these are received in, at most, F local orderings. So we don't know if an honest node has received such a transaction yet. And you can exclude these transactions from uh, the current block. The third category of transaction is a little more in indeterminate. Um, so we call these shaded transactions. And you'll really only include shaded transactions in the proposal if there's a path to a solid transaction. And otherwise, you can ignore them. So let's take a concrete example of how this works out. You build this graph between transactions. You have a few solid transactions, shaded, and blank transactions. And now, the top uh, four, four transactions here will include in the proposal. The two transactions that are solid will include because they're solid. And the shaded transactions will include because there's a path in the graph from those shaded transactions to some solid transactions. The last three transactions we don't include because they include blank transactions as well as shaded transactions that don't have a path to a solid one. And after this has been proposed by the leader, a subsequent leader can add this missing edge between the two shaded transactions um, when those shaded transactions sort of become solid in the sense that they're received by more nodes in their local ordering. And again, um, this kind of happens only um, depending on the network delay. 
Now, sort of to retrieve the final total ordering after these graph proposals have been constructed, you can think of the replicas adding these missing edges between shaded transactions to make a, pro a proposal fully specified at the end, where fully specified here means that there is an edge between each pair of transactions. And again, similar to Iquitas, what you can do is you can compute the condensation graph and again output the topological sorting of this graph. Another kind of clean technique that we introduced in Themis that wasn't done in the previous work is we can order transactions even within a strongly connected component um, in a nice way using Hamiltonian paths. And this kind of allows us to cleanly connect the boundaries of different um, strongly connected components um, so that you can get fairness even across these um, SCCs. It's very easy to integrate these um, leader proposal algorithms with an actual consensus protocol. So we uh, choose hot stuff for um, concreteness, but we can integrate it with any leader-based consensus protocol. So the idea here is the replicas will first send their local ordering to the leader who constructs a proposal which will satisfy order fairness and prove its correctness. So the total communication cost here for the protocol is n squared, but it can be theoretically improved um, to optimistically linear using SNARKs. And this is kind of asymptotically optimal um, for protocols like hot stuff, which don't have any notion of fair ordering. And sort of the nice thing here is that everything else, all the consensus parts of the protocol can be taken just from the underlying layer. So everything like preventing equivocation of the leader or choosing the leader for different slots and rotating them, all of that can be taken from the underlying protocol. We implemented Themis on top of hot stuff um, for a large number of nodes and compared performance both in the uh, single data center setting and a geodistributed setting. And basically our observations were when you have many transactions per block in a single data center setting, you can notice some difference between the performance of hot stuff and Themis. But if you actually look at a geodistributed setting, then the performance difference sort of vanishes. And the idea here is that we require sort of a beta square computation effort where beta is the number of transactions in a block, but it doesn't become the bottleneck in geodistributed settings that already have um, a reasonable latency. So the communication becomes the barrier rather than the computation. In our paper, we also introduced the first formal study of what we call suite of fairness experiments to understand the, and understand and quantify how much fairness you can get from different protocols and designs. So we compared three different settings. So the first thing we compared was sort of an ideal network setting where we try to understand the strength of a given definition in the best case scenario. And we look at the effect of um, the network and how geodistributed uh, nodes can affect uh, the fairness guarantees. The second thing we looked at was network layer transaction insertions and front running, so more adversarial behavior now. So basically we looked at a real network and tried to understand susceptibility to front running attacks. And the third thing we looked at was adversarial reordering attacks. So in particular, how robust is the final transaction ordering guaranteed by the protocol um, to adversarial nodes? So I'll talk a little bit more about the second and third one in the next few slides. So we, in our front running analysis, we have a formal result that shows that an adversary cannot front run in sort of a natural network model where triangle inequality holds for the entire network. So by triangle inequality, I mean that a communication from A to C uh, takes lesser time than communicating from A to B and then B to C for all locations A, B, and C. Um, for our order fairness properties, it turns out that node A being able to front run transactions from node B implies that there are many breaks in triangle inequality, which we found um, not to exist in uh, real world settings. So we did an experimental analysis in a geodistributed network with 100 random nodes sampled from a set of 250. 
And we found that the front running susceptibility for the uh, parameter of gamma equals one was just 2.6 percent. And for the optimal parameter choice of gamma, it was just 0.16 percent. And we can compare this with over 90 percent for other definitions based on median time stamping um, rather than our notion of order fairness. The other thing we looked at was robustness against reordering attacks. And the question we want to ask here is to what extent can the adversary affect the, fin uh, the final ordering? And we measure how different the final ordering is compared to the honest execution. So here, we kind of have a conservative estimate because um, we say that the adversary wins even if it's able to force a Condorcet cycle when it shouldn't have been there. So basically, this gives us a strong guarantee on what, like, reordering resilience would be. Um, we found that if we define transaction closeness as, or the distance between transactions, as, let's say, the absolute difference between uh, how many nodes receive transaction uh, one before two and how many nodes receive transaction two before one, then you can expect pairs with a small distance to be so-called fragile because they can be easily affected even by small variations in network delay. So you um, expect that your protocol would not be so good at handling these pairs. But it turns out that we get very good resilience for other transaction pairs, and we get a sharp drop um, in how much the adversary can affect transactions as the distance between transactions increases. So just to have some graphs here, we did these experiments for up to 100 nodes with different um, levels of adversarial control, and we see that there's a sharp drop in um, how much the adversary can affect as the distance increases. And what's cool is we compare it to a sort of median time stamping protocol as well, and it turns out that it's actually significantly easier to uh, manipulate a median time stamping protocol, even if you're given just a few adversarial nodes, than it is to manipulate like our FEMIS protocol um, when you're given sort of the maximum number of allowed adversarial nodes, which is kind of cool. Um, to conclude with some final thoughts, FEMIS uh, continues a line of exciting work, in my opinion, which achieves strong ordering properties and can be practically deployed. Uh, Themis is on the roadmap for deployment in both Chainlink and Arbitrum. Um, we also have another work which does order fairness properties for more permissionless or longish chain designs. Um, you can think of Themis as decentralizing the ordering of blocks uh, rather than having a single node or single miner decide. So this is basically decentralization as a virtue of its own. Um, we also have ongoing work, which is looking at more incentive compatibility or rational adversarial models uh, for these fair ordering protocols instead of assuming an honest majority or supermajority. Um, thank you. I'll take questions now. I've put the paper link, and code is also publicly available. Thank you very much, Mahima. Questions? So I actually want to ask you about, so like Arbitrum, right? Right now it is a permission system. So like if it goes permissionless, like and you said the, com the communication cost it can be optimistically linear, but I mean, what is the c cost of it being, I mean, what is the cost of like adversary taking the non-optimistic route? A and if you want to achieve like permissionlessness, let's say thousands of sequencers, not just those that can be forced to do the right thing, how does the communication scale there. Um, so permissionless, you can also think about like randomly sampling committees. So if you, even if you have um, thousands of um, potential participants, yeah. you can sample a smaller committee within them, and Themis can actually allow continuing the um, the ordering across committees as well, like across epochs. Okay. Because um, all right, I'll think about that. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, actually, uh, just have a question regarding to how practical you feel the uh, the initial assumption of the uh, front running. I mean, like uh, uh, ordering, because the uh, the assumption was uh, like majority of the network replicas uh, receive uh, the certain ordering. But for example, if I intentionally to attack, 
obviously, I will have my infrastructure well connected to as many uh, consensus nodes as possible. That's actually still more significant uh, than any like retail uh, traders could do, for example. I mean, from that perspective, even isn't it better to just, or even simpler to create a model that you can ensure just a certain kind of uh, um, randomness or like uh, cannot be um, attacked or randomness for like uh, uh, transactions with reliance on ordering. Yeah. Yeah, just so. Um, yeah, so that's, that's actually a very good question. Uh, basically, the idea is, you know, if you choose a random ordering, you typically think about, like, random ordering across the whole block, which provides incentives of, like, spam as well, because you can um, have a transaction that's sent, like, five seconds later, still be sequenced before in the random ordering. Um, but we, what you can actually do with them is to um, disincentivize sort of latency attacks, is each node can locally shuffle it's ordering like small in small batches before putting it into the fair ordering protocol. So that can also provide more resilience against like um, optimizing latency in your network. Um, and the other cool thing is we have sort of formal results that show if you have triangle inequality in your network, which may not be a realistic assumption, then you can't do front running, um, which can be um, sort of deployed in practice by just sampling a bigger, so having a bigger committee and sampling to a smaller committee for every epoch, because then it will be harder to um, basically optimize your latency connections to thousands of nodes instead of just 10 nodes. So in the, in the first example that you showed, uh, the adversary can still uh, bribe using some kind of transaction fees, and the nodes can stick to, uh, you know, take the bribe and order them in a particular order yep. according to the adversary, and communicate that to the, to the, to the leader. Yeah, absolutely. So the current protocol designs that we have work in more of the traditional consensus setting of assuming like an honest majority of uh, nodes. Um, but you're absolutely right that you can um, think about just like a single entity bribing all of the validator nodes to try to enforce a particular ordering. And this actually um, is a nice segue into um, what our ongoing work is, which is trying to design more rational adversarial models or more incentive compatible designs that can still achieve these um, sort of ordering properties. Another kind of cool insight is like you can think about um, e even if you want to ignore these like first in first out notions of fairness, you can still think about um, Themis being able to decentralize the ordering rather, so basically taking inputs from a lot of different nodes rather than a single node, um, which is at least uh, as good. As current. So you need a different definition of uh of adversary or bribing right. in future. Okay. Right. Thanks. Um, so regarding resilience to front running attacks, what happens if the adversary has a wireless network or generally like private networks that it can use to communicate across nodes more efficiently than the public networks? Um, yeah, so basically, you know, if the adversary has the fastest connection to all of the nodes ever, then there's n nothing that you can really do from a protocol design perspective. The only thing that you can kind of do is have privacy at that layer, which as I said, it's um, easy to integrate this kind of notion of fair ordering with um, encryption or privacy at the network layer. So the, you'd be able to prevent like most kinds of attacks that rely on transaction data. But if the adversary has like sort of the fastest network everywhere, um, then that's sort of the best that you can achieve. Hi, here. Hi, this is very, uh, very you know, amazing work. Uh, my question is, uh, how can you make sure that the leader propels a fair ordering based on the local orderings it receives? Uh, yeah, good question. So um, in the protocol that we implemented, the leader just simply forwards all of the replica orderings that it gets to all of the nodes, so that's why it takes n-square communication. Um, there is a more theoretical design that you can use SNARKs, but it requires expensive kind of proving correctness of computation of this graph, and we don't know how to do this like efficiently in practice, so that's a theoretical, uh, optimistically linear design. But in the deployed version, we just forward all of the replica orderings. Okay, thank you. Hi. So I think some blockchains have like fee markets where they try to prioritize based on how much you're willing to pay. And so your ordering is based on timestamps. Does this kind of trying to come, 
trying to look at both of those, making making like a multi-dimensional ordering. Like, like, is there tension between what you're doing and, and basically fee markets? Um, yeah, I think that, that that's basically an open question. Like, uh, I don't think that uh, intersection has been looked at that uh, closely. I would say. So it would make it harder to implement, like, on Ethereum L1. Yeah. yeah. All right. If there are no more questions, let's thank Mahima.